Here we yeah. go. All right. So, Marty, I'm going to... Um, I'll start just to do some introductions, but really this is your bag today. So I am so excited to uh, learn from the expert who is Marnie Landry. Uh, she's, uh, we're gonna be talking to everybody today about project-based learning. Project-based learning is a, a group and community effort. So this can't be my bag, this is ours. I know, <laughs> I but- do it without you. Marnie doesn't take a lot of compliments, you guys. She's no. like so humble. So I try to give her all the love I can. Um, so, so thank you so much uh, for being with us today. We are Grand Canyon University's Canyon Professional Development. We are PD with Purpose. That's professional development for K-12 educators across the world. We bring purpose in everything we do. We aim to inspire and empower you so that you can take that word on and inspire and empower your students. This is our team. We have an entire team here just ready to support you, um, led by Dr. Tacey Ashby here. And today we're really excited that Sierra, our student STEM worker, will be not only um, sharing her knowledge, but also closing us in prayer today. So stick around for that. And then after the prayer, we'll definitely have some Q&A. I am Corey Araza, 17 years plus in the classroom, mostly in the 9 through 12 world, computer systems, ESL, Spanish, and STEM integration in Arizona. Marty Landry. Um, 16 years in the classroom, high school, all types of science, mostly life science, and teaching research product projects and STEM integration across the curriculum. And she was a presidential candidate for teacher of the nation in 2013. Okay. So again, lots of love to Marty. John Berkheimer, if you want to just raise your hand, I know he's the mass man today, but John Berkheimer is the shop supervisor. He is, um, we are so blessed and lucky to have him as a part of our GCU staff. John, would you introduce yourself? I'm not sure we can hear, if we can't hear you, I'll introduce you, but if you want to just talk about this slide for us. Um, yeah, I come from um, developing consumer electronics. So I, I have a lot of products I've taken from concept all the way to being made in the United States or being made in China. So I've done all aspects of product development. Um, and to develop, develop probably over 100 products um, during my, my 20 years of doing this. Um, I started at GCU about eight years ago um, working for another department when the shop opened up. We opened up a shop here that's developed uh, just for the capstones to be made, uh, the pro the, just for the capstone projects. And I looked at the shop and I said, this is what I want to do. This is a great job. I get to work with students one on one. Um, and I get to take them from a year for a year to take it from concept all the way to a final product at the end of the year. So it's like my wheelhouse. Um, and I love pulling in people from the outside. Um, I have con uh, several people in the industry I've met over the years. If I need to bring them in for a particular product, I bring them in. Um, it's a great, great thing. And I enjoy being a mentor. So um, this is like my ideal job. And this is where I'll probably retire. So that's <laughs> <laughs> that sure says a whole lot about Grand Canyon University and what what we stand for as a university. But ultimately, John, these students wouldn't be doing what they're doing without your mentorship. So I first and foremost want to thank you, and I also want to thank you for being so willing to being a to be a mentor for us, for our department in K twelve, and for outreaching the way that you do. So a huge, you know, I'm going to love you up like I do, Marnie. I just really, really appreciate that you said yes, because folks, if John didn't say yes, this wouldn't be happening today. So thank you, thank you, and thank you. Um, speaking of saying yes, uh, you have this great student that works for you in your department. So um, let's go ahead and toss the baton. Uh, luckily enough, uh, we, we get her in our department as our STEM student worker. John has her, hired her as a machine shop uh, worker. So Sierra, will you introduce yourself? Yeah, hi guys, I'm Sierra. I'm a mechanical engineering major. Uh, can you guys hear me, Corey? We sure can, yep. Awesome, cool. Um, I've started to get involved in various engineering clubs, as you can see. I work here at the shops and I help Corey out with various things like this. Um, so I'm just starting to learn the ropes and um, really like the shops help learn, like project-based learning is really applicable in here because basically you learn as you go by doing various projects. So um, just wanted to share that with you guys today. Also, this is Brandon. He's way smarter than me. So uh, he's, what are you? Uh, mechanical and electrical. Mechanical and electrical engineer. So um, he's going to help us out today with some of the machine and solid work stuff. And you know what's great when you said he's way smarter than me? That just means <laughs> he has more experience because he is 
a senior. Am I right, Brandon? Are you heading into your senior year? Okay, yep. so Sierra, you're a sophomore. That just means that he's got a little more experience. I don't know if that means he's smarter, but definitely more experienced, right, Brandon? Brandon yeah. and I have worked together before <laughs> um, on a fantastic project for an elementary school where Brandon single-handedly like used the Haas to build this amazing bridge project. So we'll talk a little bit more about that. So excited to have both of you with us. Um, we are going to just outline, I'm going to outline goals and objectives, and then we'll have Brandon set our stage for learning in just a second. So today we are going to um, talk about involving community experts as mentors um, as they create authentic learning, for, uh, learning opportunities for students. So you're going to learn at least three strategies that prom promote authentic community engagement. Identify sources for experts, hint, hint, we got a few right in front of you. Asking for mentorship, that might be the hardest part, but we've made it really easy for you today. And then number three is sharing with a public audience, because if it's not publicly <laughs> shared, your students, you know, they might play mom against dad, right? It's all about being in front of authenticity. Then you're gonna evaluate our webinar, earn a PD certificate, and we'll have a closing prayer brought to you by Sierra. And then we'll have some Q&A at the end here, um, and Sierra will be here to answer some, some questions in the shop. So here we go. Uh, Brandon, if you wouldn't mind, um, tell, tell us, uh, just set our stage for learning by telling us why you chose this quote. And uh, go ahead and start with the quote. Uh, colleagues are wonderful things, but mentors, that's where the real work gets done. Um, there's, there's a lot of truth in that statement. You know, you can only learn so much from a book and uh, in classes. You really got to have someone to go ask questions to. And, you know, sometimes you got to dummy check, you know, hey, is what I'm doing right? Is, is what... Uh, I'm thinking, is that the right train of thought? Um, you know, you got to have someone that knows what they're doing and, you know, you can ask a question, you know, I, uh, you know, I can ask John pretty much any electronics question and he can say, yep, that's right. No, that's wrong. Uh, you know, why are you cutting those wires? That's not the issue here. <laughs> you know, um, any question you ask, he can, you need to find someone that can answer those questions. Thank you so much, Brandon. So mentorship for you has meant a great deal in your in your time there at Grand Canyon as an as an engineering major. Awesome. Well, we can't wait to hear even more about that. I'm gonna um, uh, go ahead and 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 pass the baton over to Marnie uh, as we do our tech tool for audience interaction. Um, Marnie, do you want to talk a little bit about Google Forms as you ask these questions? Okay, so in a moment, we're, I'm going to ask you to use a separate tab or a separate window in a browser. You don't need to do it quite yet, but just prepare yourself or on your phone. Um, and we're going to be using Google Forms just to collect a little bit of information from you. But my question here is I just want you to think about if you're doing a project yourself or if your students are doing a project, who should have input on that project, right? Like, how do you, like, should somebody else have input? Is it just you, the teacher, because you know the learning targets? Um, and another thing to think about is who are project stakeholders? So who will be affected by the project? Um, sometimes it's, there's unintended consequences. There's unintended audiences. So it's really thinking about who those stakeholders are. So if you could um, go to the bit.ly and Shonda, thank you, Shonda. She's our, um, in the background running all the magic here. Um, she's put that link in the chat. What I'd like you to do is go there and answer a couple questions. It is completely anonymous. Um, I think there's three multiple choice and then there's an open text question. So if you can go ahead and do that. And Corey, if you click over to the... Yeah, and I'm, I'm noticing that the bit.ly for me anyway is not working. So I'm gonna go ahead uh -oh. and pop this link in, but watch, I'm gonna show you how I do it. What I do, wait, let me cancel that and I'll show you. I click this send button and it's kind of, you know, we pop that in there and then I click on the link here. I can even shorten the URL if I want to make it a little shorter, uh, but I'm just gonna copy that and then I'll paste it right into the uh, chat bar there. So y'all, if you can get to the bit.ly link, please click on the link that I just popped in the chat and, and you should get directly to this to this editable, uh, I shouldn't say editable, I said uh, the form where you can answer the questions. So yeah. many of you are already savvy in making Google Forms and using Google Forms in your classroom, but just in case you aren't, uh, we definitely want to show you how to do it on the back end as well. Ultimately, the questions are more important than, than the method, but, but since we are here to teach you methods and 
the questions behind the methods, um, you know, we'd like to show you both ends of the spectrum there. So, so Marty, um, here I'm on the questions. You let me know when to head over to the responses. Oh, what do we got? We've got a few responses in there. Go ahead and click the responses. Um, and, and, look in, and they're populating. You can see yeah. them populate right here. Yeah, so that's what's really nice about using it. It, it populates live. Oh, we're getting there. So if you just saw it clicked over, yeah, 789. So if you're using Google Forms, that's really nice because you can see the answers um, as they come in. We're up to 12. Oh, so let's, what do we have? Have you ever had someone solve a problem without for you without your input? Um, a majority, yes. Oh, the people who have said no, that's fantastic. I'd like, like to find out how you had that happen. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe they're in positions of uh, authority. Oh, that could be true. There's 30 Maybe they're the ones saying, I'm doing all the decision making, right? <laughs> all problem solving. Um, number two, have you ever used a product that needed one small change for it to work a whole lot better? 100% yes. This is one of my issues. Um, like the dressing, salad dressing, the little tab at the top that I can't grab it and peel it off to open it. I like, if someone would just ask that, you know, is it working for you? No, just make it two millimeters longer and it would work, you know, or opening that milk carton and the, the, it doesn't work. So yes, one little thing. If I could just tell those packaging engineers, boy, things would be a lot better, right? Um, oh, I like this. Okay, I'm comfortable with asking for help in my current role. Yes, I ask for help all the time. We've got about 42%. And sometimes it depends on the situation. It is because we have a room full of educators here that are, they say rarely, you know you can't do it alone in the world of education. Is there anything you'd like to add to this before we go back, Corey? I, I just think, uh... I, I think that what you just said about the milk carton, like how many times that's happened to me, and, and I've, I've worked in schools for so long, and I was the media center specialist, and in that, in that area, you know, I, you really realize, oh boy, this was developed in 1952, and geez, do we need different things as technology and different pieces and parts of st students' education are changing. So I want you to think about what's happening um, in this pandemic-ridden society, like how do we need to change and morph our engineering thought or our project-based learning thoughts to accommodate um, what's happening now, right? What, how, what students need now. So I just figured I'd throw that out there. It's a very Perfect. cool idea. Okay, Thank anything you. else? You, do you wanna look at the back of the house here a little bit? Um, you're welcome to, go ahead. All right, so, so just so you know, this is the form and, and um, we went here and you're seeing kind of the editing piece um, here. And I can, because I am editing, uh, it's, it, I own this form, I have some, some tools over here. I can insert anything from an image to a video, text, um, we can uh, text, we can upload or even share files in here. So that's just adding to any one of these questions. You can see here I've added this question and I can have multiple choice, check boxes, drop down, um, linear scale all the way to dates and times. So this is just uh, Google Form. If you haven't, if you're not experienced with Google Forms, uh, we do have, uh, there's tons of YouTube videos out on forms. We're going to share some tips of the day. All of these things will be in your show notes from uh, this YouTube lesson. So if you haven't used them and you want to, absolutely. Um, Marty and I use these all the time. Very, very quick and easy to use. In fact, yesterday, Alyssa Schumann and I were uh, working on this for a SWE document. She's even going to use a Google form for elections. So that's, gonna, that's a really nice way to use a Google form. If you click over in the responses area, you can see that as people are responding, it populates immediately, which is really nice. And then beyond that, Marnie, what I love is that it goes directly to a Google Sheet. So that's your Excel document. So now, now not only is our information populated in responses, so we can see that directly in a form, but we can also see it populated in an Excel quite quote document Google wouldn't like me saying that. It's actually a Google Sheet, but it looks like Excel, and then you can play with this data. And uh, if you know anything about Marnie, she is a data hound. She loves data and making sure that, you know, we are making data-driven um, assessments, et cetera. So that is a very, very cool tool. If you haven't used Google Forms, I highly suggest that you do. We'll make sure to get a tip of the day out there in our YouTube channel and Google Forms specifically as it relates to project-based learning. Anything else in the back of the house here, Marnie, that you wanted to talk about? No, I think that's good for today. Okay, and then you had that last question. We'll come back to that later. Got it, she's gonna come back to that later.
Got it, got it. Okay, um, moving on. Yep, so just a quick takeaway for those of you who just use the Google form. What's your takeaway? Like how do you foresee that you could use it if you haven't used it? And then also your thoughts about the questions about, you know, having minor problems that if you only had a say in them where you could improve, you know, your usage of a product or your life um, or people solving problems for you without your input. I don't know. I've, I'm not sure if I've ever had that done as a teacher um, at an administrative level. <laughs> oh, so if you can kind of pop your thoughts in the chat, we'd love to see what you think of that. And if you're interested, um, we also have this awesome, uh, it, it's, it's just a, a, it's a forced copy of a document where you can, if you're interested, kind of put your takeaways there and use this as a teacher tool. Again, that will be available at the um, YouTube channel in the show notes. So we'll make sure to get that available for you. It looks like this. So you just kind of take away your thoughts. So in the chat, what do you think? What are your questions about the tech tool? Thank you, Christine. Yes, it's a great piece for students. Uh, thank you so much for making that. With online learning and many assignments for students, Google Forms are a great check-in to see what kiddos are doing. Oh my gosh, so true. Thank you, Kristen, for saying that. Formative assessment. It's a fantastic formative assessment tool. So project-based learning is built on formative assessment. It is not, if you've ever done a project the old way and everyone you did all the teaching and then they did the project at the end and then you have this humongous project and all this grading to do at the end and you give them that summative grade that is not project-based learning. Um, it's all about formative all along the way. So great point. Really cool. And uh, yeah, Gail, thank you for your comment there. Um, it could be a useful tool to help build community depending on how they're used. Absolutely. And they can be used in so many different ways. Like I said, we're going to, you know, Alyssa and her team are going to use them for elections because they have to have virtual meetings now. So what can we use as a tool to um, elect our president, vice president, treasurer, uh, unless we use some, an electronic tool that's totally, you know, transparent for all of your members. So that's just one idea. Thank you so much for those comments. Mm -hmm. Keep them coming. If you have questions and uh, questions, we have answers for you. And again, we'll have some, all this information in the show notes. All right, so to, get to our point, we're talking about project-based learning today, and we like to always focus on the three R's, relationships, relevance, and rigor, and today, specifically, we think it will help focus on relevance when we're talking about authenticity, um, using mentors, using experts, and sharing with your community, so really kind of focusing on that relevance. So there are lots of elements to project-based learning. Go ahead and go and far too much to do in one webinar, far too much to do in even one course. Project-based learning is an ongoing process. It's not just a one-size-fits-all you know, teaching method. So lots of different elements. You, if you've learned about it, you've, you've read that there's different names for different parts. People call it different things, but essentially we're talking about the same aspects. Number one, and primarily authentic content and context meaning the students are engaging with something that's real, not fantasy, um, and their context when they're working, they're working in a, um, like the real environment or the, as much as you can recreate that real environment. Sustained inquiry, meaning whatever they're learning about, it's something that they're interested in and they're gonna keep asking questions. It's not just you forcing them to learn about it. Peer review and revision, voice and choice, they have some choices in the project. Notice collaboration is the next one underlined because interacting with your community and experts takes collaboration skills. Reflection, how did I do? And finally, sharing with a public audience. So it's kind of the, really that interpersonal part we're talking about today. So thinking about collaboration in your classroom, think about how much students collaborate and now what that looks like in a virtual environment, it probably looks quite different or it will in a couple weeks, right? Um, so when you have students working together, collaborating, how often are they completing a complex task? And I don't mean everybody fill out part of the worksheet and pass the worksheet to the right. That, that is working in a team to finish the worksheet, but it's not complex. How are they learning to become effective team members and leaders? Meaning you gotta remember they're not coming to you with those skills, so it's gonna be challenging. You, you are helping them become that. Um, how, you know, how do they get to interact with adult mentors? When I say that, it's not you, the teacher, because they don't view you typically as an adult mentor. You're just the teacher. So it always, it's always like 
like you said, the mom versus dad, you know, it's a, somebody else saying it. If you're a parent, you know, you've said something to your child a hundred times. They don't listen. The first time someone they look up to outside of you, they hear it, right? So we have to teach them how to, how to interact with those adult mentors. So the big point here is that group work is not collaboration. So although you may have, and I'm, I've had students work in groups my whole teaching career, absolutely. And a lot of times when I look back, oh, they weren't really collaborating, they were just kind of working together. Collaboration involves struggle, it involves communication, and it involves reliance on one another, okay? This, I especially like that last bullet point, um, talking about mentors, experts, and community members. So using them, we can really insert them into the engineering design process. And the engineering design process, although it sounds like I'm not an engineer or it looks really complex, this is the process for solving problems. This is the process for, you know, experiencing a project in your classroom. This is a process for solving a problem in your everyday life, right? So, and I want you to just pay attention to what's right in the middle that every single step relies on is that stakeholder. And this can be one of the most challenging parts of project or pro problem-based learning is figuring out who your stakeholders are and actually communicating with stakeholders. So we have some great guests today with us who are serving as stakeholders for teachers and students and sometimes are stakeholders for us as we're learning how to teach new topics. So Sierra, if you want to kind of pick up from here and tell us how the engineering design process relates to interacting with stakeholders, interacting with mentors, and what you guys actually get to do in the shop. Yeah, so basically the whole premise of the shop job for student workers here, for uh, me and Brandon and other students who work in here, is to really get like the hands-on approach of learning engineering. So instead of just studying in classrooms, we're actually able to come uh, here in class and outside of class to really uh, just get that hands-on approach to learn by uh, doing projects and not just solving problems theoretically in class. So um, DCU, we started this whole idea and the project we're about to show you was called a bridge, bridge project and a high school reached out to us at the shop and said, hey, we want to do a, a project that we can do online for our students over the summer, even during all this COVID quarantine stuff. So basically that was our problem. We were like, all right, we need this project to help uh, these high school students. Then we started imagining solutions. We ended up um, being like, all right, how do we do this online process? What can we do that enables us to do that? So we came up with this project where they would design a bridge. Um, we defined the specifications. What would that bridge be like? What were the requirements? I think it had to be like, what, like 12 inches by three inches have a certain amount of um, surface area, that type of thing. Then we were gonna send it out to them. Um, that was the plan and then we tested it and we realized, oh no, that thing got canceled. So now we had to re revise this and start doing this webinar. So um, now we are presenting our project that we made for you guys. And we went about our process of figuring out how to design a bridge um, out of an acrylic material and now we're going to be sharing that with you guys, um, how we did that. So, Brandon, if you would like to uh, walk through the beginning of the whole process and how we started. Um, so pretty much to begin with any project we generally start here in the shop, we start out with a SOLIDWORKS model. Um, sometimes I might even start out on an asking drawing, say, you know, this is kind of what I'm thinking, you know, what do you think, this is what I want. Um, and then we have somebody go draw it in SOLIDWORKS. Um, so this is kind of the bridge that we started out with. I drew this one and then Sierra and Christine kind of took it from there and said, oh, I want to change this. We want some holes there. We should change it out a little bit. We should make it thinner. Uh, but they had somewhere to start out with. Um, and SOLIDWORKS is kind of the, the bread and butter of where everything kind of begins for the shops. Um, and what's nice is you can say, okay, this is a bridge. And in theory, we can run something and say, well, um, we should think it should look like that. You know, we're going to have it fixed on two ends and we're going to put a bunch of weight in the center. And that's what should happen in theory. Um, and then we can go into reality and say, well, what we saw on the computer, is that what happened? Um, you know, and it pretty much looked exactly like this when we broke it. 
so we can say what we saw on the computer pretty mimics what um, what we saw in reality. Um, but what we didn't see in reality is this only bends in one direction. Um, what we saw, oh, it, it does change. What we saw in reality is this was bent, you know, way out here like a W almost, or like a U shape. But in the computer, it doesn't really look like that. Um, so there's a little bit of, you know, you have to reality check yourself sometimes. And having partners to work with can go, is that really how it's supposed to look? Or how did you do that? Explain it to me. Um, and that generally kind of makes you uh, think out loud and say, all right, this is how I did it. Here's my plan of how I think it's going to go down. And then they'll say, well, did you think about this? Or is that really how it's going to happen? Um, you know, and they kind of make you, or they, they force you to think through your idea a second time and explain it and back up your, uh, your explanations. So, Brandon, you went through this process because you were assisting the school, right? It was a K-12 school with their project. So this was something you were helping them because they didn't know how to do this planning, right? Yeah. Great. And if you don't have SolidWorks, Brandon, um, I, I have used Tinkercad. Is that something that, like, for students at the K-12 level, could they use something like that? Um, because I know SolidWorks takes a lot, of, there's a learning curve there, and you are, you are brilliant in SolidWorks just by looking at what you're doing right here. So it's really awesome, number one, to have your ex expertise. So those of you listening who are in the K-12 environment, you know, ask mentors to help. Brandon could be a great mentor, for example. Like I would ask Brandon, hey, can you help me really look at this concept that I'm trying to work on for our students. But I do think that Tinkercad might really um, help at least get an idea. Have you ever heard of that, Brandon? Yeah, um, Tinkercad is a great place to start. Um, it's also like Google SketchUp. Um, it's a great place to start thinking into 3D shapes. Um, you know, th this is very advanced software. I mean, this is industry standard software. Something like this could easily be done in SketchUp or Tinkercad because it's a, a very simple shape, um, so you know. Simple things are great for Tinkercad, and it's a really good um, starting place to begin with. It, you know, once you learn the skills of how to think in 3D, moving to SolidWorks is not a big jump. And this is helpful, I think, for kids. Like, if you start introducing that into a lower level education, um, it's like for me and just school and stuff. There's so much I learned so much more from when I had actually some a project to work on and things to learn from, um, and that goes all the way. Up. It kind of you kind of make it your own. And all the way up, even here at GCU, like we are allowed to keep our intellectual property here. So if we're making something like this in the shop and we want to keep it and maybe use it in production, like we are allowed to keep that and it's fully ours. GCU doesn't take any part of that. So um, just that project-based learning like kind of grows and it helps you learn and merge that into something that's actually going to be able to help you in your future. Such a great point that GCU allows students to not only manufacture and you have someone like John Berkheimer who has all that experience to be your mentor, but also if you create something that you get to hold on to that intellectual property. And then also, don't you guys take like a, a, a business course as well to be able to, you're, you work with the business college to make sure that you understand what patents and, and, uh, and scaling is all about. Is that correct, Sierra and Brandon? Yeah, so basically we take this class called STG 110 and it's team innovation experience. So they partner us with the business students and it's really a class to help engineers understand uh, the process of business and because everything we do is really revolving around a business environment, uh, even though we are engineers. So it's really a class to help us partner up with that and get more perspective um, and start to thinking about what we do in a uh, product standpoint rather than just engineering. So great. It's so great because it just directly helps industry. So I could talk about this all day long, but I do want to see a little bit more of the shop and your project um, as it were. So um, I guess if Brandon stops sharing the screen and you start sharing your screen, Sierra, uh, there we go. Um, I will spotlight this video and um, let's see, that's the computer. Am I spotlighting that or a different one? You turn your you're, you're spotlighting the one with my name on it. I will turn the camera on it. Got it. And as she's figuring out that video and they get up to walk around, um, I put a little note in there. I just heard this the other day. I hadn't heard it before. STEM with a second M that they really think that marketing needs to be a part of STEM because we're not solving problems in a vacuum or in a bubble. 
you have, we're mostly solving problems or doing projects for a client, for a stakeholder. So I thought that was really, really key. So, all right, we, you're on, let's see. All right, so here's the shops, here's one of our leads. Um, and so I'm gonna take you guys over to the finishing room, which is the second part of our process. So in here, is our laser cutter. So this is our laser engraver. Um, this is where we printed out our original grid. So I'm just gonna get one started for you guys so you can kind of see how it works. We go onto this computer, Frank can you log in? Yeah. Get that up. Um, and it loads onto this. It's connected up to this big vent. The ceiling has this giant fan on the ceiling. We have to have oxygen hooked up. So it um, doesn't catch on fire, Sometimes it has before, but um, <laughs> yeah, so we put our acrylic into this scene, we load it up into the system. Um, that sketch that we do on SOLIDWORKS, we sent over to this computer, saved it as a different type of file that this machine will understand. Um, as you can see, it's pretty much the same. Uh, this is the latest adaption, so we could mount it in our uh, testing stands to see how much weight it supports. So um, we're ready to go. And so this is our laser cutter. This is basically how uh, we are able to print out models and kind of test some of the theories that we do. A giant person. Yeah, so perfect. So we'll go over, check our laser cut. Uh, we actually have one uh, pre-cut out for you guys. So we'll just take a quick look at this just so you can kind of see the progress it's making. Um, we uploaded the program, it's printing it out, and then we're good to go. So if you want to stop the program, and we will go over to our testing station. So we took the liberty to go into the wood shop. So this is what we call our main shop in here. Um, it has a lot of our metal mills and drills and that type of thing. And in here is our wood shop, um, where we have a lot of the saws and uh, this is our band saw, our top saw, table saw, and over here we have two of our coworkers, Christine and Philip. Say hi, guys. Um, and they have helped us put together a little testing station for our brain. Oh, that's so, so cool! We have um, where we put the testing station. We have kind of a lens. It's probably harder to see during this video, but. Um, once we put weight on it, you'll be able to see the stress that is inflicted upon the bridge. And so, uh, if you guys will start putting some weight on. Yeah. So, you can start to see it as time goes on. It takes a little bit, so I'll go in and out so you guys can see. Um, as it goes down, the bridge starts to flex and bend. and this bridge actually holds a surprising amount of weight, we discovered. Um, what was the original? It was 30, the, this bridge held 35 pounds of weight under it. And what was uh, the SOLIDWORKS program that we originally started with, it can predict how much weight it can hold. And didn't you predict it, Brendan? And what did it say originally? It was so if you're thinking about 32, which is pretty accurate, um, it just kind of goes to show real life is a little bit different than modeling. So you're going down, as you can see, it's really flexing a lot. Um, it's not really having a good time, but it's still holding and it will probably hold for a lot longer. Um, but yeah, as you can see, SOLIDWORKS did say that there would be some flexing in uh, the, lengthwise of the bridge and it's doing that. Um, the solids just goes to show how the industry standard people really know what they're doing and how they really understand what happens in the programming is pretty accurate. So um can you put on the light real quick Brandon? Oh and there we go it broke. We're at about 75 newtons. So 75 newtons is about, about uh, okay, guys, we have to keep moving along here. Um, okay. That's pretty awesome there. Was there any last things that you needed to show us in the in the shop? No, I think okay. that was the shop. And here's just the final product of the bridge. It broke near the bottom. And that's a wow. 
Okay. So what's so cool about this, um, Sierra, is that um, as a project-based learning assignment per se, these students are able to see this the engineering behind it. Not only did they see the engineering, but if they have the, if they use SolidWorks or Tinkercad or Google SketchUp, they're seeing some computer science. They're getting to know what engineering is really like. But at the end of the day, Marnie, this is about the project to try to create this STEM and uh, STEM virtual camp uh, for this uh, for this high school, right? I mean, ultimately, high school teachers were asking us to help them teach engineering virtually. You all just taught us engineering virtually. That's pretty darn cool. So we we can't thank you enough. Please stick around. Um, I'm going to um, pass the baton back over to Marnie so that she can continue to work on uh, the project-based learning piece. So don't go anywhere because we still have some questions. And um, and we just want to say thank you. Thank you to Brandon and, and, and John. Brandon being the senior, you're kind of the mentor. You're taking over the mentor spot there, I see. And John clearly has been mentoring for quite some time. So thank you for that. I'm going to cancel that um, spotlight video just for now, but don't go anywhere. We appreciate it. Marnie, um, I'm going to head back uh, your way uh, as I share my screen. I was just on Tinkercad, so let me pop that <laughs> here. I know I was all excited. Um, and, and this is, uh, we'll share this with you a little later, folks, but this is just a video um, the, uh, about our personal protective equipment development at GCU. And you can see that um, here is featured uh, the Dean of Engineering, uh, Dr. Janet Fornari, talking a little bit about uh, Dr. Janet Brenlin Fornari, why our 3D print labs and our, and our machine shops are so important for community outreach. Uh, this again will be available in the show notes and if we have some time, we'll come back to this video, but really uh, we want to make sure that y'all get the idea of what project-based learning is uh, before it's all, all said and done. Um, experts and mentors, Marnie, do you wanna talk a little bit about how, what GCU does for- well, Just the fact, hopefully just seeing you, those were regular GCU students doing what they do. Um, doing authentic learning and sharing what they're learning, and they are there to be experts for you. Um, our professors, our programs, that's what we love to do. We want to support K-12 educators. So if you are um, engaging in problem or project-based learning, I hope that you'd be engaging in projects that stretch your own knowledge and, you, and force you to reach out for assistance. Know that we have that ability. And I would assume that most colleges or universities, if you're not in our area, um, would also be willing to help you. But we also have the ability to help virtually. So what Corey has up here, we do have a program called GCU Live that does um, live interactive activities in all areas, not just STEM. And um, when we can do them virtually, when and if we go back to in-person, we can also implement these in-person, meaning we have a representative in your classroom and a, an expert streaming live and your students are doing a hands-on activity. So we are, that, I mean, that's our purpose um, is to serve, support, and inspire. And we want you to take advantage of that. And we'll have this link in the show notes. So don't worry about that. Um, just quick in the chat, any thoughts on seeing the engineering shop, seeing those students in action without a script. Uh, and, and Marnie, there was a question in here earlier yeah. uh, about Tinkercad and uh, Cynthia, you had, had asked if uh, you'd heard that SolidWorks is the industry standard. So Sierra, if Brandon is still sticking around, he can also jump in with this uh, answer. Uh, it, it's expensive, yes, SolidWorks, it, it is expensive, but Tinkercad is free, I don't have any experience. It is, uh, do the presenters think it could be used think that it could use these CAD type programs. All right, do could kids, so between John, Brandon, and Sierra, could kiddos, elementary kiddos, use uh, Tinkercad and Google SketchUp? Maybe go to go the lowest age level that you think they could use them. And Dan Utex here too, I'm sure he's used them. Oh yeah, that's right. Kids, he's, he, yeah. I, I think you might be muted. Try now, Sierra. Um, think, Tinkercad, uh, it's really the, the hard part of any 3D modeling program is trying to think in 3D. Um, that's really the thing that people struggle with. It's not really using the software, it's how to, how to take something and break it down into little tiny parts. You know, you're looking at a full Lego set, how do you break it down into the Lego pieces? So that's, that's really the hard part. 
It's a great metaphor. I love it. Thank you, Brandon. Okay. <laughs> Hopefully, Cynthia, that answered your question. If you have any other questions, please pop them in the chat, and um, and these guys will definitely do their best to answer them. Um, okay. Also, I think she was specifically asking the age range, and I think um, probably middle school kids. Could, I it's not, I started my elementary brother on SolidWorks. It's not that hard. Uh, so Tinkercad is kind of a step down from SolidWorks if you just want to get started. So kids very young could really get started in figuring it out. It's, it's, if you know how to use like things like PowerPoint and Word, it's the same kind of concept to just understand how to use the software. You start playing around and clicking things and um, seeing what they do and then you go on from there. So I think kids could definitely use Tinkercad as uh, a step to SolidWorks. That's awesome. Thank you guys so much for that, that comment. Marnie popped in the chat, three to eighth grade. Honestly, I'm with you. I think that um, once kids start thinking in 3D, and what's to say that they can't think in 3D at that young age? It's like speaking a language, right? Um, if you start speaking Spanish at age three, then you'll probably be bilingual, right, as you get older. So I would, I would definitely give it a go. Thanks, you guys. And if there's any other questions, um, pop them in the chat, and Sierra will be sticking around at the very end. Uh, but what we're going to uh, move through, Marnie, go ahead and talk to us a little bit about asking for mentorship. This can be challenging for teachers. Um, I think this is probably one of the greatest hurdles um, when doing project and problem-based learning. I know everybody said in the, in the answer um, in our, our Google form that they're used to asking for help. Um, but that's sometimes that's different than actually reaching beyond your boundaries to an expert may, that you maybe may not know. So the first question here, these are the things you really need to address when you're reaching out for an expert or mentorship. Who? Who do you ask? Well, contact Grand Canyon University. We are here to support you. Um, but I would assume most universities would have you know, some type of outreach that they could also um, support you with. But there's more than just your, your local university. Corey, if you'll pop back to the Google form and that last answer there, this one, do you want the responses yeah. or the question? The responses. Okay. My question was, what interests, talents, or unique skills do you have besides teaching slash education? We got some great things here. Whomever you're interacting with, and one of our other teammates, Carolyn, I don't think she's here today, she's taught elementary school, and she would have a question like this on her letter home when it was, you know, trying to learn about her students. What are their hobbies? She would have a question for parents. What are your hobbies? What are you an expert at? She had this entire bank of people with expertise in a lot of different areas that she didn't have expertise in. And, and also think about this as a way to be culturally competent and acknowledging people's strengths and what they have to contribute. When you ask those parents and your community members what their strengths are, it gives them a, an avenue to contribute um, to the learning. So art and design skills. Yeah, that's not me at all. I'd be reaching out to you in a heartbeat. Um, that is such a great point, Marnie. Utilize what you already have in your classroom. Uh, students, parents are key stakeholders. Yes, and I know when you're in person, depending on your school, that can be a great challenge because you may have to have fingerprinting, a one-month approval before they can come in the classroom. It's, you know, it runs the gamut. Now that we're working virtually, what an asset that is. Um, we have so many professionals and parents at home now that they have the ability to stop and interact with you and your students in a virtual world. There's no need to worry about the fingerprint and the approval and all of that because they're not going to be in person and you're on your own secure server with the school. So it's a gift. It's right? a gift. I love it. Thank yeah. you, Marnie. Okay. So that's who to ask, what to ask. So, um, I found that when people would reach out to me, even when I was in the classroom, because I had um, some other sets of you know, expertise that I could share with people, oftentimes they don't know what to ask. They just say they need help. I need help too, but um, <laughs> you need to be specific. So if you're working with a team of students, that's something they need to work on about asking for specific help. Like the, the school couldn't just come to um, Sierra and the GCU shop and say, we just need help. You know, we, they had to, you know, be specific. We have an engineering design project we want, you know, what do you have to offer? And they had to go back and forth. It was some of that stakeholder input and feedback. So being very specific. Yes. So who should ask? It is best if the students can ask. It really is. 
because I almost never have anybody say no when the students ask for support or input um, from an expert. They just want to give. A lot of sometimes when the teacher asks, they're not as always willing. So training your students how and who to ask, key. We would do projects and I always didn't have a budget. Um, but if I worked with the students ahead of time to write a, an official letter for what their project was and what they wanted, if they went to Home Depot with that and the students did it, they got what they wanted. Really good point. Have the yeah. students. They're, they, they're cuter than I am, for sure. I, <laughs> oh, always, yeah. I always put them in front of people. I love it. Okay, and the final, whoop, there's one more on there about the how to ask. Oh, sorry. Okay, so this is kind of the critical one. And this is something I would teach my students when they're preparing to ask for support, whether it was financial, materials, or uh, mentorship. You want to keep it simple, direct, and I have a little formula. Number one, who are you? My name is so-and-so, and I'm a student with such-and-such -such, um, in my English class. So who are you? What are you doing? We're creating a project to um, use poetry to express um, our experience in the this past six months um, as a community member. What do you want? You know, we would like for you to, as, a, as someone who's an expert in poetry, to come give us some feedback on writing that poetry and how we can better express ourselves. So who you are, what are you doing, what do you want? That's simple. That's so great. And you know what Dan was just mentioning in the chat, uh, one of our uh, other professors that was on our Wednesday webinar, she had mentioned the, uh, oh, I'm asking for a friend. Uh, so if you're not, if, if your students are, are uncomfortable, have them ask for a friend. That's very cool. All right, let's, uh, I'll move on to this next slide. Go ahead. Yeah, um, we're gonna probably cut this a little short so we can make sure we get the close out. But the final part is, it ha you have, the students in authentic project-based learning or problem-based learning have to share with an authentic audience. That just means not you and not necessarily their classmates. Your community could be the experts that you've reached out to. And trust me, if they've helped them along the way, they want to see how it turned out. So you're going to build those relationships and you have an instant audience. And your students are going to want to try harder to impress and share with them the work they've done. And, and these photos are from GCU experiences where we create this public audience experience utilizing GCU professors and students and community right here in our Canyon Corridor. So definitely reach out to us and we'll share with you how, how we can help um, create these authentic experiences. But beyond that, if you're an educator listening to this, I highly recommend you take the PBL series. We'll be talking about that in just a little while. It'll take you the next step so much uh, easier. So, and so we'll, we uh, had to cut short. We had to cut our public display this past year because it happened right when all the closing happened. We will be having a public display, whether it's virtual or in person, this next year, um, kind of as a summative event of the project based learning and some of our other PD we give. So, keep your eyes and ears open for that. You are all welcome to show off your students. So, I just want to touch back on the elements of PBL. And really that collaboration. Collaboration is not group work. Collaboration is give and take between students, between mentors, between experts. Those experts will bring in a sense of authenticity and those experts can also be your public audience at the end, in person or virtually. As they did today. So thank you. Uh, John Berkheimer and Sierra and Brandon and Christine and all of you who worked in the shop tirelessly to help us out um, with our objectives today. So hopefully educators were able to walk away today with those three strategies, identifying sources for experts, asking for mentorship and sharing with the public audience. These individuals who came to you today, that they are your public audience. So don't forget that you have all kinds of support right in front of you, especially in times like today. It, it can be very challenging to feel like you're not isolated. We want you to know that you are not isolated. We are here with you to empower, educate, and inspire you, our community, so you take action to fulfill your purpose and to serve others. Uh, we want you to, um, to know about some opportunities coming your way, uh, just like, the, uh, just like uh, the GCU machine shops and our engineering world was really highlighted in our Summer of STEM series. Uh, we are going to continue that Summer of STEM on August 26th with cybersecurity at our Cyber Center for Excellence. So please join us on August 26th uh, during the same time, 10 a.m. Arizona time. 
And don't forget to sign up for our PBL PD series starting 9-8, that's September the 8th. And we'll make sure to have all these in the show notes at the YouTube channel. We have the T in STEM PD series, that's technology in STEM, right? That's what we are all focusing on. That starts the 10th of September and then differentiation in, in instruction series uh, starts also in September on the 22nd. So join us for those opportunities. And here is, um, speaking of serving one another, uh, first off, we want you all to definitely fill out our Canyon PD webinar. We'll make sure that that uh, link is in the chat uh, to get that to you as soon as possible. Um, I'm not sure if Shonda's back or not, um, Marnie, so if you want to pop that link in the chat, that would be great. I think Shonda got booted out for a little bit. She'll, she'll be back in a second. But as we um, pop that link in and we ask you to evaluate our webinar and tell us what you want to see more of, um, in the spirit of service, Sierra, would you mind um, taking us through our closing prayer today? I will um, state the, the, the verse here, and then if you would be so kind as to take us through our prayer, it would be great. Um, it's actually, uh, we, we went uh, back and forth on verses, so we've got Ecclesiastes 4.9. Um, nine, nine and 10, two are better than one because they have a good reward for their toil. For if they fall, one will lift up his fellow, but woe to him who is alone when he falls and has not another to lift him up. Sierra, if you wouldn't mind taking us through our prayer, that would yeah, be fantastic. Absolutely. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for this opportunity to just get to learn more about this world you've created, Lord, and how uh, you've designed us to interact with each other and learn and grow from each other, Lord. I pray that we take this information that you have blessed us with, Lord, and to help us uh, see you more clearly and to present your ways to the world around us, Lord. Help us to support each other, Lord, and to learn and to seek out new ways to glorify you through project-based learning and just in our lives in general, Lord. I thank you so much for this opportunity to meet together even in the midst of this pandemic, Lord, and uh, I thank you so much for the team here and everyone you've blessed us to be able to help today, Lord. Amen. 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 Sierra, thank you so much. That was just such a gift. Um, <laughs> and, and I definitely, we are at the, at the time now where um, we just want you to, if you haven't filled out the evaluation, folks, go ahead and do that. But now we're at the Q&A. So if you have any questions and answers, don't forget to join us next uh, in August for cybersecurity, but questions and answers, you have the experts right here in front of you. Um, I, I actually, uh, John, I wanted to ask you a question since you're still on, um, if that's okay with you, I forgot to ask earlier, and that was, um, tell me, uh, clearly you are a key, a crucial mentor, because you haven't been uh, you, you haven't even hardly been in our, in the webinar, which means that your students took over everything. You've taught them so well. They don't, it, it almost looks like they don't need you, but I know, I know they do. So how do you make it? Um, how do you, how do, how do you empower your students like you do? Cause clearly, uh, there's a lot of empowerment here. What, what is your secret sauce? Um, I, even on, on a micro level, if, if, if they want to learn something on the mill, um, I usually come up with a real world project and say, you know, let's go ahead and let's make these parts for the shop. Let's go ahead and make these braces that we can use um, on the mill to do other things. So try to make it a, you know, a real world project, I think makes a big difference. Um, try to let, you know, I, I usually make them always draw a project in SolidWorks first and kind of go through the process. Even if it's a day process, we still go through, let's, let's, let's do this, let's build this, this is how we should do this. Um, and then I let them make mistakes as long as it's not something that's gonna hurt them. So, um, and they learn from that. So try to keep it as, you know, real world and, you know, be patient and let them do it. So it's kind of paid off. Uh, kind of, it, it has, has paid off. <laughs> it has completely paid off. Um, I so I'm just kind of I'm quoting you. I, I did a little paraphrasing, but what I heard was uh, real world projects. Draw it first in SolidWorks. Uh, let them make mistakes as long as it's safe. Be patient and let them do it. I yeah. mean, th this is simple but yet profound, right, Marnie? I mean, this is amazing to me. Um, you are, you just have a gift uh, for this. So when uh, you said you might retire here, a GCU's gain is all I'm going to say. They're a gain. Uh, you are an amazing mentor. And 
even when I've come in, folks, I've come into the shop and asked John to help me out. And he is so open um, armed and how can I help and what can I do to help? Um, however, I also want to say that it helps to be specific, right? Like, so when people come in, like Marnie had mentioned earlier, you got to know what to ask for, right? That was your point, Marnie, of really know what you want before you come into a shop. Because I imagine y'all are super busy every single day working on um, projects, especially like the face mask project. And, and it really helps when you know what people want. Is that is that fair to say? That is fair to say, yeah. <laughs> I, I would I think about it this way. Um, when you're reaching out to a mentor or an expert, um, you don't want to use their time for them to brainstorm with you what you're trying to do. And that's really what's happening if you ask to, for your, broad, your ask is too broad. So you really want to be as narrow as possible before you approach with that ask. Um, because you don't want to wear out your welcome, right? So you want to get the, the most for your time, the, you know, the most for your money. I really want their expertise. I don't need them to think through how I'm going to teach this project. That's not their purpose. Thank you for saying that out loud, Marnie, because that I, I've been in a, in a shop situation, not quite like this shop, but um, in the library media center where we sort of help people with the 3D printing. And without people knowing what they want, it's really challenging. Um, I'm popping into the chat um, the actual bridge video, Sierra. I popped that up in uh, YouTube as an unlisted link, just so if you guys wanted to see the slow motion video. So that's there, um, as well as um, this, the, the, the face mask video will also be in our YouTube link notes. So we'll keep those in the link notes, but I just want you guys to unmute uh, and, and ask questions if you have them right now, because we're just, we're just having fun right now. And Kristen says, thanks for the insight. Glad I could join, have another meeting. Yes, it is 1101. Thank you so much for being here, Kristen. We appreciate you. And um, yeah, so definitely ask any questions if you have them, but um, we'll stick around for another five minutes. Uh, no, four minutes actually. Uh, if, and because, you know, the important part is we, we got to get those uh, shop people some some food because they're they got to be hungry by now right so it's time to eat some good pizza and uh and enjoy but uh we're here for a couple more minutes uh for a couple more questions well i'll, I'll ask a question um i guess of john or sierra so if we do have a teacher still in the audience or we, when we interact with teachers um what is what is one way you feel like you could support like during the school year how could you help? What kind of projects would you be willing to help? How, how do you like to feel um, that you're supporting them? I don't know if I asked that right. Like, if they came to you, what kind of things do you think you could actually give to them? And I, when I say give, I don't mean give them equipment, but I mean of your time or of your expertise. Um, Good question. It, in the past, like for some of the robotics clubs at the high schools, you know, they'd come and said, you know, can you help us make this part? Um, and it's the same thing. We'll have them draw it up. We'll discuss it. You know, we can, you know, they usually supply the material and we'll go ahead and, you know, use the plasma cutter or use whatever equipment we have to make a part that they can't make. Um, that might be an example. That's a big deal too, right there. Yeah. Yeah, that's a big deal. Nice. Okay. And when you speak of robotics, um, you know, we are the Central Region Mesa Advisors. Um, math engineering science achievement so if anybody out there um, in the audience is a mesa advisor or is interested in be having a mesa chapter you've got an in right here with corey and i um, supporting in the central region and secondarily we have an engineering shop here to also support you so and and yeah it's stem awards so if you want to start a mesa chapter at your arizona high school definitely get in touch with us um, uh, you know, we are, we are here. I'm at Sierraza at Twitter, all those good, good, good things, as well as you can just, uh, communicate via email. So definitely give us a shout out. We are so excited, uh, to be here with you today. We're going to close out today's, um, lesson on, on how Grand Canyon University supports community, specifically through our engineering shops and project-based learning. 
we thank you for your time, your energy, and your enthusiasm. I'm going to go ahead and, and, and stop share and stop our meeting. Thank you. Thank you. Um, wait a minute. We've got a couple more uh, just pop in the chat. Um, we appreciate it. Thank you, Adriana, for your comments. And uh, Cynthia says, I know I can use students' interest to uh, help them make things into their reality. I alluded to this earlier, but my son had ideas that he thought should be patented. Oh, a good, good comment. I, I took him to various companies and they spoke to him about doing things in CAD. He drew them out and spoke to them. This would have changed everything. So what we're doing here at GCU, and Cynthia just told you here now, what we're doing here could have changed everything for her son. So let's make sure that it changes things for your students. Um, Cynthia, thank you so much for sharing that. Yeah, That's just you. heartfelt. We really appreciate it. And um, yeah, spread the word. Spread the word. And uh, he's in college doing it now. So <laughs> good. And we appreciate that. But we appreciate you uh, and your positive comments. Thank you to John Berkheimer. Thank you to yeah, Sierra uh, Malmberg and, and Brandon and Christine and all the rest in the shop. Um, pizza's on the way, folks. Can't wait. Thanks so much. And uh, we'll talk to everybody later. We'll see you next time for cybersecurity on August 26th. Take care, all. Okay. Bye.